All right, um, so I don't see the screen on my computer, so if it's okay, I'll stay up front here, close to you. And I want this to be very uh, informal, so if you have any questions, just feel free to stop me anytime. Um, I got interested in crowdsourcing when I started uh, talking to David Cogger, who has been done a lot of very nice work in implementing and coming with new uh, ways to do crowdsourcing systems wise. And we got interested in some mathematical understanding of crowdsourcing systems. And in this talk, my goal is to tell you that um, there are a lot of several interesting challenges that are still open, which is perhaps related to recent advances of our understanding in um, sparse random graphs and problems on sparse random graphs, such as maybe community detection. And some of those tools might be able to uh, tell us how to solve those open challenges in crowdsourcing. So I want you to, uh, that's the uh, goal that I have. And this is based on joint work with David Kagar and Debra Shah. And there'll be second part of this talk, which is more recent uh, work with my colleagues at uh, Korea at KAIST. Right, so what is crowdsourcing? So crowdsourcing, you can think of as an um, example would be either Yelp or um, Wikipedia, where, which has changed a lot of our lives. But in this particular context, we're interested in what's called crowdsourcing microtasks, or I'm also going to use crowdsourced classifications. And an example of this is, let's say you have a plane which crashed in a desert, and you want to find the plane using satellite images. Okay. But desert is big, and computers are not yet good at finding this type of image recognitions. So what you want to do is you want to use humans to do this in a scalable way. So what you do is you break the satellite images of the desert into millions of little patches and post them on a crowdsourcing <coughs> platform like this one here. One example is Amazon's Mechanical Turk. And what happens is that there'll be thousands or tens of thousands of people there who are willing to pick up these images and solve the task. In this case, is a classification whether you see something that's fishy, looks like an a, a airplane, or not. So this is how we view this crowdsourcing system works. So you'll have, as a task master, you will have thousands or millions of small tasks. Each needs to be classified. And what you do is you group them together, a subset of them, and into a small batch. And each batch will be solved by uh, any worker who's incoming, who picks up these batches and uh, completes all the classification tasks in that batch. So this person will be telling us whether there's something fishy or interesting in this image or not. And you repeat each um, task, asking it to multiple people. So after a while, you get several responses on each classification task from multiple people. And the goal is how do we aggregate this information using the structure of the graph so that you get the best accuracy in actually identifying the true label of these tasks. So there are several things going on here. One is that, well, we want to reliably estimate the true labels at minimizing the cost. So we're assuming that we pay for each label we get. So the total cost is proportional to the total number of edges we place on this bar part type graph. And there are two aspects to this problem. One is task assignment. Since you're designing this uh, crowdsourcing systems, you can choose to, however, group these um, tasks together. Effectively, you're designing this bipartite graph, which tells us which tasks are assigned to the same workers. Okay. And we're going to assume that each worker is arriving in an online fashion, meaning that you cannot apply usual techniques like a bandit, where you try to explore who is a good worker and try to assign more tasks to each worker. So these workers are fleeting, so each one will come and complete one batch and leave, and you'll never see him again. And we're assuming that there, <clears throat> the whole process is operating in two process, two phases, where in the first phase, you try to come up with your own uh, task assignment by part of the graph. And then all the tasks will be completed by the workers. 
And once you get the uh, responses, you do the inference once in the end. Why do you want to do this in two phases? Um, well, in practice, what you could have done, the only other thing you could have done is you create one batch that will be completed based on that uh, responses. You can decide to create the next batch. So that's the uh, adaptation that you can do. Um, one uh, answer is that in practice, you don't want to do that because all things are happening in real time and the tasks uh, are in pre-loaded to the system. So if you want to actually do this on real Amazon's mechanical Turk, it's difficult to do any other patient. That's one thing. The other thing is that theoretically, we can analyze, for example, what you can do with how much you can gain by adaptation, try to quantify the gain or price of the adaptation. And we show that there is no uh, effect of gain. Later, I'll come back to that. But for simplicity, let's assume it's a two-phase uh, model. And then allowing adaptation doesn't help you too much. That's the message. Right. So for the task assignment, we're going to compare to the best task assignments you can do. But for now, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to assume that we're going to use random uh, assignment. So we're going to look at random regular graph to do the, to the task assignment. And for the purpose of the talk, we're going to assume that there are n tasks, and n is equal to n, same number of workers that are eventually going to solve this, or same number of batches. So n is equal to n for the purpose of the talk. And we're going to assume that there's a L and R, which again, because n is equal to n, L and R is the same for the purpose of the talk. And we're going to use, use random LR regular bipartite graph, chosen uniformly random over all um, random uh, regular graphs to assign um, tasks. So effectively, how much you're paying per task is proportional to the degree L. And we want to understand how the performance depends on this parameter L for large enough M. And the reason we're doing random assignment will be clear when I explain what the um, algorithm and the proof is, is that we want to use locally tree-like structure of sparse random graphs to do the analysis. And also, we want to use a, a graph that's a large expander, which has large spectral gap in order to um, prove in order to achieve uh, high performance. Right. So the model of how people answer to this uh, type of question has been studied since 70s. And the typical model, which is sometimes called one coin model or Dawit and Scanner model, is that each person has a coin, which is parameterized by, let's uh, say, PJ for worker J. And PJ comes from some distribution, IID. And when a task i is assigned to a worker j, each task is a binary task, either plus or minus. And he'll give us the same, uh, correct answer with probability pj by flipping independent coin every time he has to answer a task. So on each of the edges between task i and worker j, we get a response aij, which is either plus or minus, and which is correct, ti, if it's correct, with probability pj. And one a uh, small technical detail we need to assume is that, well, it comes from some distribution f, but on average, if you take the expectation of 2 pj minus 1, it's bigger than 0, meaning that on average, it, uh, average worker is um, likely to tell you the truth. And the only reason you need it is that because if it's less than 0, what happens is that your estimate will be com could be correct but completely opposite in the sign. So resolve this ambiguity of the sign, on which ones are positive or which ones are negative, we need this uh, one bit of information telling us if you had asked the same task to everyone, do you on average get the correct solution or not? Okay. Question? But could you ask tasks you know the answers to? Right. So in practice, that's done all the time. You have a golden questions which you know answers to. You use them to uh, test the workers. Um, that has, you can use it not just to uh, identify this, but to do a lot more things. And we're going to see that, uh, theoretically, we're going to compare it to any possible algorithms, including what you're just suggesting, and show that the particular uh, algorithm we're going to propose is all the optimal up to the, um, up the constant. Right. So, um, 
But in practice, that's done all the time to pre-screen the workers. So is the setting clear? So you can think of this as maybe perhaps using um, binary symmetric channels with unknown uh, noise. But you're not allowed to do any coding on this side because it doesn't make to sort to, to images and ask them to classify. This kind of coding technique doesn't make sense. So you can only use repetition codes. And you have um, binary symmetric channels coming from some IID channel um, status. And you want to come up, understand what's the fundamental limit, and is there an efficient algorithm which, which achieves this fundamental limit. And we're interested in the high dimensional setting where the degree is order one with respect to increasing perhaps the number of tasks and number of workers. And what you want to do is that for each task, let's say ti, you perhaps, if you can, if you, can you would like to uh, compute the likelihood given the A is the whole set of responses you've got, and choose the one that's more likely. And the metric that you're going to use to measure the performance will be there what's the probability of error on each of these tasks. So on average, how many errors did you make? But this one is computationally infeasible. So what typically has been done is that, well, this model has been studied since 79 by David and Skene, who initially proposed, proposed this model. And they assumed um, that the priors on the uh, task ti and the worker quality pjs are uniform. And they tried to solve the maximum likelihood problem using EM approach without any theoretical guarantees. Um, and we are interested in the high dimensional setting where L, the degree, is order one. So it's a very sparse graph, random graph. And we want to come up with the, um, understand the minimax rate of maybe sample complexity and also probability of error. But you went into, sorry, you went into a particular algorithm or you want to see what the best is? Um, so we're going to be interested in identifying, characterizing the minimax rate for the best algorithm. And we want to come up with an efficient algorithm, which was used it. Hmm. So both of, both of them. And in a slightly, um, so following our work, this was uh, 2011 where we first started working in this problem, um, Michael Jordan's group also studied the same problem, but in a classical setting where L scales like M, meaning it's a dense graph. So for all practical purposes, you can assume that everyone is solving every task. So your uh, graph is complete graph. So in that setting, what's happening is that as M grows, each task is getting um, increasing number of responses. And just by doing, for example, module pivoting, eventually you're guaranteed to uh, correctly identify all the tasks. Well, their setting is a bit more uh, non-trivial in the sense that they look at multi-type multi -type, uh, labeling tasks. But they come up with a new algorithm, which is EM, initialized by spectral method, meaning they use tensor decompositions to identify the uh, worker qualities. And using this, they start their EM process, starting from the uh, output of the tensor decomposition. And they show that the probability of correctly identifying all of the tasks jointly is scaling like uh, uh, probability of making error on at least one of the tasks is going to like e to the minus some constant times m. So I can run the simulation and create a bunch of tasks um, with a bunch of workers from some distribution f and try different ideas. So first thing that anyone could do is majority voting, which is typically done in practice in a lot of cases, is that you just ignore the structure of the uh, graph. And for each task, you aggregate all the responses and take the majority vote. And there will be the purple line here in this particular example that I picked. And the algorithm that we propose, I just call it iterative algorithm, but it's both inspired by belief propagation and spectral method, as I'll make it clear as we go along. 
and that achieves this green line here, which is significantly better than majority voting, for especially for large number of task degree L. And we can also do billet propagation. One thing is that we need to know the prior on the PJs. Well, TIs is not, you can assume it's uniform, it doesn't uh, depend too much on the prior on the t tasks, but it does depend on the prior on the workers. And let's say we know, we could uh, estimate it too, but let's say we know it and run billet propagation on this problem and then achieve this um, blue line here. And I'm comparing it to an Oracle estimator, which you run billet propagation, but you truncate it at certain depth k, such that the tree structure is preserved. And at depth k leaf from a particular node i, you allow them to know an oracle that tells them what the true tasks are. So given true tasks at depth k leaves of a tree, you run belief propagation, and because belief propagation is exact on trees, this will be a lower bound on what any algorithm can achieve, and that's this red curve here. So looking at this, uh, several interesting things are going on that we would like to understand. So one thing is that belief propagation seems to be uh, matching the uh, Oracle estimator in all the um, instances that we tried. So that's one thing we would like to make precise and say whether belief propagation is indeed optimal or not. And the other thing is that, well, the iterative algorithm, which has spectral um, intuitions, seems to be doing pretty good. So we would like to use this iterative algorithm, which is <coughs> easier or somewhat simpler to analyze as opposed to belief propagation, the performance of analyzing belief propagation, we do not know how to. So we want to use this iterative algorithm to put an upper bound on what is achievable for cross-source classification and compare to a minimax lower bound to identify or characterize the minimax sample complexity for this problem. And if you look at here where we are on a critical regime where we have very small number of workers assigned to each task, then some things happen here that might be interesting. One thing is that if you're below certain threshold, so if you, are, you have too few workers uh, per task, then what happens is that the spectral method becomes worse than even the majority voting. So we would like to know where such thing happens and why. And if you're far below this threshold, what seems to happen, we observe, is that even the belief propagation seems to be doing no better than uh, majority voting. And it seems to be um, universal, whatever instances we, we try, if you're far below certain threshold, then no algorithm can do any better than majority voting. So we would like to understand why such things happen in this problem. Mm -hmm. work is close to zero at that point, so you get zero equal even majority voting. Mm -hmm. right. right, so what happens is that it, the point where this happens depends on your F, the prior, prior on your workers. So making workers really bad, you can make this threshold go all the way up to however, wherever you want right. to happen. Right, so. the point at which the input of the workers is nothing, right? That's the point where it happens. Right, so, but then nothing depends on how nothing you are compared to random guess. So, and we would like to understand, for example, how if, so the limit we're talking about is you take good quality of the workers uh, defined by the prior F close to, unif uh, close, close to uniform, which is half, everyone giving just a random answer. And as you get close to this half, how would this threshold scale, for example? That's the kind of question we're interested in. Right. Okay. All right. So um, first I'm going to tell you how we uh, uh, characterize the minimax rate on the sample complexity of this problem. And let n of epsilon be the number of edges or number of samples you need in this problem to achieve, let's say, probability of error less than some small epsilon. And we define the minimax rate 
as the nature choosing the worst case prior on the workers from a set of priors that are characterized by or quantified by Q that I'll explain in a bit. So there are infinite number of choices and you look at all the class of uh, priors and the nature chooses the worst one. And we try to do the best thing we can do in terms of putting a bipartite graph that has the same number of edges and doing the best inference algorithm that's possible in this problem. And the number of uh, samples that you need, we can show is scales like m over q, which I'll explain in a bit, which quantifies the quality of the uh, workers, times log 1 over epsilon. So q here is roughly like the second moment of the workers, uh, scaled appropriately. It's related to expected log of Bhattacharya constant for channel coding. And when I explain the spectral method, it'll be clear why Q comes up uh, crucially in this problem. And this is linear in M. There are M parameters that you're estimating. So in terms of M, this is the best you can do. And proving a lower bound that scales in this way is not too difficult. You just need to find the right example distribution of F in this class which no algorithm can do better than this. Proving upper bound is uh, more tricky, so let's look at what inference algorithm that we need to use to solve this inference problem. So you're given the responses and the graph, and you need to infer the tasks. The first thing anyone would do is majority voting. You aggregate all the responses in this case, and then take the sign, and that will be the majority voting. On the other example, if someone gave you the, let's say, the quality, actual quality of all the workers, then you take the weighted majority voting, weighted according to log of pj over 1 minus pj, and that's the optimal uh, decision you can do. You can simulate this, and there's a big gap between what majority voting does and Oracle estimator does. And what we want to do is come up with an efficient algorithm that doesn't ac access the Oracle, but does similar to the Oracle estimator. So we need to come up with some way of estimating the reliability of the workers. So that's our plan. And the first thing that anyone can try out is what I, for, for lack of a better word, I'm going to call it traditional spectral method. And this was done by uh, our Peter Gosh. And this, her, Exactly, exactly. So that's where I'm going at. Oh, that's what you're oh. Right, but it looks like spectral method. That's why I'm calling it spectral method, but I'm, I'm going to make it precise, yes. But, uh, that, but what you said is precisely what one should do. You do it once to get better sense of the tasks, and maybe you can use it to get better sense of who's good and bad, and then iterate. And that, um, in our proposal, ends up being a power iteration for spectral method. But there are other ways to do it also. <coughs> right. So uh, one way to do it is the spectral method. And the intuition is the following. If you look at the A, the sparse matrix with plus 1 and minus ones weighted according to the responses, then this matrix in expectation is rank 1, which is not difficult to show. So you can think of this data as rank 1 matrix with left singular vector equal to actually the true signs of the tasks, plus some random perturbation. So this is not difficult to show. You just have to compute the expectation of each entry, which ends up being bilinear form between ti and pj. And then putting it as vectors, you get this rank 1 signal. So this suggests a very natural spectral algorithm, which is you just take the data and do SVD, take the first singular vector left and right, but we only need the left one because we only care about estimating the tasks, and maybe take the sign to get the estimate of that task. So this is the first spectral method, and this works okay, but this has two main um, drawbacks. The first one is that, well, as uh, anyone working in spectral methods know, with spectral graph knows, um, 
Spectral methods like this one fails when there's an imbalance in degree. In particular, let's say if it was Ordoshi Reni graph that we're using, bipartite version, with L equals 01, which is the high dimensional regime that we're interested in, then just by the fact that there will be one node with degree increasing like log 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 n over log log n, square root, uh, this will fail miserably, and it does. Or any heavy tail distribution or any imbalanced degree, spectral methods will fail. So that's the first reason that this is not a good idea. Second reason is that, well, we can analyze this algorithm using traditional spectral analysis, and that shows us something like this. So this will be a pictorial proof of a spectral analysis of this algorithm that I just presented. And what we can do is that, well, if you look at the histogram of the singular values of this matrix A, because it's rank one structure, there'll be one singular value that's standing out, which is order L times square root of the Q, which is nothing but just the uh, spectral norm of this rank, rank one uh, matrix. It's easy to compute. You compute it, concentrates around this value. And then you can also use um, concentration results in random matrices to show that the rest of the singular values will be at most order square root of L. So when L square root of Q is larger than square root of L sufficiently, <coughs> which happens if you have large L, big, much bigger than one over Q, then you can expect the spectral uh, gap separation, and then for singular vector corresponding to singular value might be a good um, estimate. And you can make all this precise and show that um, when you have a spectral gap, then you have a Frobenius norm bound on the uh, perturbed random matrix that can be turned into bound on the singular vectors using Davis Kahn theorem, for example. And after all the algebra, what we get is the probability of error on average should be order of 1 over LQ, is what uh, typical spectral analysis gives. But this is not good enough because this will say the spectral, uh, the um, sample complexity will be m over Q times 1 over epsilon as opposed to log 1 over epsilon that we want. So because of these two reasons, we want to come up with a revised spectral method. But is there any questions before we move along? Please. Your model assumed that the degrees are... Right, right. Um, so let me, let me just again explain that. So for the analysis of the particular proof that I'm going to do, we right now need LR regular graphs. But we want an algorithm that works for perhaps Ordo Shireni and any perhaps reality. The algorithm needs to be robust. Analysis is for LR regular. So um, that's, you're, you're right on that. So let's say um, we propose an algorithm which we call iterative algorithm, which is a revised spectral method. Um, <coughs> And it's the, it goes as a following. So we're going to propose a message passing version of spectral algorithm, which is now well known as maybe non-backtracking random walk, or um, yeah, uh, under uh, non-backtracking operators. But let me uh, motivate this algorithm as we discovered it through spectral methods. And how we do this is that, well, we're going to keep instead of keeping a vector where each entry corresponds to its task or node, we're going to keep a message, a real valued message, for each edge going each directions. So there will be a task messages going from a particular task i to each of its neighbor worker j, and worker messages going from each worker j going to task i. So all practical purposes, you can think of it as applying Billy propagation but with some different update rules. And in fact, this is the algorithm we're going to propose, exactly build propagation when you don't know what the prior is. You put a prior on f, which is mismatched, which is not actually the true prior, and you get exactly the algorithm that I'm going to propose. So you can think of it as a message passing algorithm. And the update rule is the following. You initialize, let's say, worker messages with some random Gaussian with mean 1 and variance 1. 
and you iteratively update these messages according to a linear mapping. So when you update task message going from I to J, what you do is you look at all the incoming messages, W, and what it means will be how reliable each worker's uh, answers are. And you uh, take the um, weighted sum of these messages weighted according to what uh, response that worker gave. So if reliable worker says it's a positive task, then you say it's more likely to be a positive task. And on the worker side, you do the same update, taking the linear sum of the incoming messages and weighted by the responses that worker gave. So intuitively, this will be saying that, well, if a uh, <clears throat> worker said, uh, if, uh, if a task is likely to be a, let's say, negative task, and this worker said it's a negative task, so if the signs match, then we give more credit or more reliability to that worker. So that's intuitively what's going on. Then we do this uh, iterative update, uh, linear update of the messages, and we use this to estimate the uh, task signs in the end. And this algorithm, although we initially, this was motivated by, uh, for us, or by belief propagation, we wrote down belief propagation and tried to, to come up with some approximation that's analyzable. Well, this has a nice interpretation as a speckle method because if you look at all the messages, T's and W's, and put them as a vector, two times the number of edges, vector, and look at this update rule as some linear mapping B, then what we're doing is we're just doing power iteration on this matrix B, looking for the top eigenvector of this matrix. Means we want uh, T and W, which satisfies B times C and W is some eigenvalue times C and W. And if we do this, uh, we're claiming that this is a good estimate. And one kind of hint or intuition behind this would be that, well, we can look at this matrix B, we can simulate this for some instance with 1,000 nodes, with some, I think in this case, four or five uh, degree um, L, and with some worker quality, and look at this matrix B and plot the scatter plot of the eigenvalues of B, because it's a sc scatter plot because it's now no non-symmetric matrix. So you need to look at both imaginary and real axis of these eigenvalues. And if you plot it, what happens is that there'll be one guy sticking out in the real axis, which is the largest eigenvalue. And there'll be another one in minus of that because of the bipartite structure of our graph, but they're coming in pair. And all the rest will be concentrated within, and in this case, almost on this circle of certain radius. So all the spheres, uh, single eigenvalues are within some circle, and there'll be two, effectively one, because they come in pair, uh, eigenvalue uh, sticking out, please. Uh, you said this algorithm came from the, uh, the approximation to BP, does yes. it also come from the linearization of BP? Or other so, um, uh, exactly. So this, Similar non-backtracking operator has been discovered in community detection by linearizing BP in that context. Sorry. Is it the case that for this problem there is a trivial fixed point of building propagation? Is there a trivial fixed point? It would be different. Um, I do not know the answer to your question exactly right now, but I'll tell you how it's different from community detection as we go along. But this algorithm can be uh, derived from, I'll derive it later, but to give you a heads up, can be derived from writing down belief propagation with some prior f, but because you don't know, you put some prior that we chose, which is called Haldane prior, and if you just write down the BP with Haldane prior, you get this algorithm exactly. So this is different, a little bit different from the linearization. Oh, in, in this case, it ends up being linear, yeah, yeah. So right? Something special, right? Because the fact that you can, in general. Right, 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 right. This is, so the we, the reason we choose Haldane prior is because it gives us something linear, which, which we analyze. Is there anything else special about the prior? No, that's the only reason. Because in general, in the in general, it's non-linear. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. If it's mismatched. <clears throat> you're right. You're right. Um, so. 
Right. So we knew what to shoot for. We, need, we wanted something linear because we wanted spectral algorithm so that we can analyze it. And it ends up being that the particular prior put mismatch prior put on BP ends up being this one. So is there anything special of the prior? No more than the fact that it gives something linear. Right? How do you call this on sort the of prior? Haldane? Haldane. Yes. Um, prior. And this uh, matters of pj is equal to either 0 or 1 with party half. So that's the prior. So either you're telling. Why do we have a fancy name for that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Two, right. So like Radamacher variables, it's, uh, Bernoulli, but Bernoulli is also fancy. But, I mean, but be like <laughs> right. Um, I'll get to that. <laughs> uh, so you're perfect or you need to perfect or opposite perfect. Yeah. Uh -huh. wrong? Right. Uh, like, I mean, you have the prior that you assume, but there's the actual, this don't you have to do a minimum? So don't you look right, right, right. So this is what we put on the BP to get this algorithm. We analyze it, this algorithm, for any prior, any mismatched right. prior. And this corresponds to what? Which, which actual prior that you use? So here well, the algorithm only depends on no, the prior that we put on the BP. Right. No, but the, 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 show is not the Oh, answer. this one? Yeah. Um, well, you see this for almost any prior you put, as long as there is a spectral gap, and I, I can precisely tell you that the circle has radius square root over L, independent of the prior. And then this, uh, the larger singular value has, um, again, like the you, traditional spectral method, has the same L times square root of Q, where Q is now capturing everything about the prior. So any prior we are interested in Q, Roughly the second moment of, of any prior that you're going to use for simulations, analysis, or whatever. And this, um, I do not, not remember exactly what prior you use, but I chose so that Q is, is large enough that you see the separation. And our analysis will be minimax over all priors that have the same Q, only the second moment, just one number. Oh. Like, like if, for example, if in general code, right, if you pick the same capacity, which is fair, they don't have the same but the charity, right? So you should look at the one that's the worst, but mm -hmm. the charity for fixed capacity. Mm -hmm. It's not clear to me that you should fix the Q here. If you fix the Q, then by definition, right, it basically doesn't depend on it, right? But is that the fair thing to do? Well, this analysis uh, is only for the random matrices. It has nothing Actually, to do with the context the itself. The distribution has the same mean reliability or something, and then look for the worst Q. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, because, you know, why should you pick the one that has all fixed Qs? The Q is, is the parameter in your thing, so it's convenient. Uh, true. Are you expanding? Right. Uh, so I, I understand your point. Um, you like a half. Are you expanding about a point where you, you're not very reliable? Right. So you can think of it as uh, expanding it in terms of Q going to unreliable. And then there will be the first order term, the first linear term uh, in that expansion. So, it's like a low so the other differences will be coming up, but the dependence will be, uh, will be lower order in terms of Q. Yeah. Yeah. OK. <laughs> All right. So given this uh, spectral gap, uh, what's nice about this uh, now revised spectral method is that, well, <clears throat> we can use locally tree-like structure now, because our algorithm is the propagation-like. We can use density evolution and to very, well, we're analyzing particular eigenvector, and we need a precise analysis on each entry of this eigenvector, which is typically very difficult because of over random matrix. But in this case, using density evolution, we are able to capture precisely how each uh, eigen entry in the eigenvector is perturbating 
and show that when we see a spectral gap, in this case when L square root Q is bigger than square root of L, then the probability of error does scale exponentially minus LQ. Okay? And that's where kind of smaller order terms come. It'll be minus constant LQ plus some smaller order terms in, in terms of Q. And <clears throat> which gives us sample complexity that we want. And this is uh, minimax optimal in this sense. We can prove a lower bound that matches this if we consider a class of distributions which is characterized or parameters by this Q. Hmm. Right. And what it means in, the, in terms of the actual performance is that, well, there will be some threshold above which we prove uh, exponentially decaying probability of error, as we see in the um, simulations. And below the threshold, we see that the spectral, um, the first eigenvalue will be completely observed into the spurious eigenvalues. And spectral algorithms do not work. And that's why we um, see performance decay below the threshold. <clears throat> and another reason that we like this uh, non-backtracking operator or revised spectral method is that this is much more well behaved compared to the typical uh, spectral method. And what we mean by that is that, well, the value of the first eigenvalue and the spurious eigenvalues, the radius, will be concentrating very tightly. So if we simulate it many times and plotting uh, L square root of Q and then square root of L <coughs> as a function of Q and fixed L equals four in this case, then you can see that the prediction is uh, pretty good for example in this analyzing the eigenvalue as opposed to where you use traditional methods, spectral method and look at the singular values in positions will be very, uh, there will be a big perturbation. In practice, what, we, what, uh, what it means is that, well, if you do random regular graph as we propose to, for the analysis, then you see some spectral gap in the singular value of typical um, adjacent matrix A, and compared to the eigenvalue of the non-backtracking operator or revised spectral method, then you also see the spectral gap. So both of them would work. But if you go to some other degree distributions like heavy tail uh, graph, then what's going to happen is that for your um, adjacency metric, typical, typical, uh, typical spectral method, then your um, singular va value that you're looking for will be comp completely observed into the spurious ones, and you don't see any uh, spectral gap. Whereas in the B matrix, what happens is that the fluctuation actually happens contained within a radius of similar, uh, circle of similar radius, and you can still see the uh, spectral gap. And these two are coming from exactly the same data. So it's one uh, instance of the data. And these two also. So this kind of gives you a sense of why um, revised spectral methods are more robust against this degree imbalance. And when you run the whole cross-sourcing algorithm using the singular vectors and eigenvectors, and we see this too. So one way to uh, account for such a degree imbalance is to use Laplacian type of HSE matrix where you, um, you divide by perhaps the, the number of uh, degree. And that does worse. And spectral method is the typical spectral method using just the adjacent matrix. And message passing will be the non-backtracking operator B that gives you better performance in terms of the whole um, process of doing crowdsourcing. And how we analyze it is, do I have how many? Three minutes? Okay. And how do we analyze the um, eigenvector of such a non-backtracking operator B is the following. If we run this message passing algorithm that we propose, in first iteration, you TIJ is a task message, it's going from, going from a task to a worker, will be something 
Gaussian-like, pretty random. And then the second iteration, it don't see much happening. But after some iterations, it's one instance of a problem. I'm looking at the histogram of the message values. After five iterations, you see a separation between the messages that corresponds to tasks that are positive labels, the ground truth, and then tasks that are negative labels. And after a while, it's um, converges. And what we are effectively doing is we're making a decision um, cutting it at zero if the message is incoming to a particular task when you sum them up or um, bigger than zero you say it's a positive task and if it's smaller than zero you say it's a negative task and that's our uh, rule for making the estimate for the labeling and what we can do is we can this is a message passing algorithm and it's locally tree, uh, tree like graph so you can apply density evolution but this is somewhat a Typical, not typical, in the sense that the messages are not discrete, or the uh, alphabet is not discrete, okay? although the messages are real valued. And it's not Gaussian either when you are in a high dimensional regime where the degree is order one. So it's not clear how to analyze this, but what we do is instead of just following a particular parameter of this distribution, we look at the momentum generating function of these messages in the density evolution ensure that it's sub-Gaussian, and we can recursively find the parameters of the sub-Gaussian distribution of this, each of this lobe, um, which is the mean and the effective variance, and show that probability of error using Chernoff in the end, which is the probability that you're in this tail, given that you started with the positive task, or you are at the positive task, it's bounded by something going ex uh, down exponentially. So, so do you track it separately for the positive tasks and the negative tasks? Um, no. In this case, what's simple is that um, the actual uh, problem performance is symmetric. So you can assume everything is positive. That's how I do it. But if I plot it all positive, it looks funny. So that analysis assumes everything positive. But it'll be the same if we end on that. Right. And the connection to belief propagation is that for this problem, you could have written the joint probability and write down the belief propagation update rules. And, but if you assume that the prior is the, the simple prior that we assumed, and then write down the um, belief propagation update rule again, then it ends up being very simple linear update that we saw is exactly the algorithm that we propose. So that's one way of interpreting our algorithm. <clears throat> and the reason I um, am interested in this problem now is that there's a lot of connection between this problem and to other known advances in community detection, for example, and other sparse random graphs. Um, there has been a lot of work in non vectoring operator by perhaps um, Mark is not here now, but uh, Mark and other uh, his co authors, and also Mosul Neiman Sly. that could bring us new, give us new ideas on analyzing and understanding this uh, cross-sourced classification problem. The length of the borrower, the borrower, they had just recently a paper uh, on doing exactly the belief propagation style analysis for the tech track community. I think she may have talked about it at our last year. So they have a lot of follow-up work for 15, 16, which yes. is very much... One thing I have to say is that there's no way I'm gonna write down all the, uh, or even just the names. So I'm, I'm skipping a lot of them. One very nice work is started by Lenka with the conjecture for community detection, followed up by spectral redemption paper, which is very nice, and very other, various other things. I'm sk skipping many of them due to lack of space, and I'm just giving you these four because I think that's more relevant, uh, or I'm this relevant to what I'm working on in, in, as a continuation of this project, but uh, there there is um, um, hundred other citations that are related. 
Right. I'm just starting to observe those new uh, techniques and applying them one by one. What I'm doing right now is using Mosel Niemann's slice paper on proving optimality of Billy propagation. So BP is optimal for community detection under certain regimes. And we use that to show that BP is also optimal in certain, use their technique, well, the details are different, uh, to show that uh, Billy propagation is also optimal for cross source classification. And that's how this paper would relate. And other papers uh, uh, will also be related in a similar sense. And that's my goal for this talk, is really to give, present this uh, model to you problem and, and tell you that there are a lot of interesting open challenges that are out there, which uh, could give new, uh, which might require new technical uh, advances that are not in the community detection, for example. And the other uh, interesting work, uh, one by um, David <laughs> recently, which analyzes not, uh, which looks at not just the fact that this non backtracking operator is better than spectral method, but for in the context of matrix completion, you can come up with a different generalization of other algorithm. In this special context, uh, alternating minimization algorithm, commonly used for matrix completion, can be extended or generalized to account for not the um, uh, nodes, but edges. So there will be edge version of alternating minimization, which in practice, uh, he shows that it works better than the typical uh, alternating minimization that people work uh, use. And I think it's a very interesting take on the uh, non backtracking operator. And Given this, I'll um, mention our recent one recent work, which um, tries to prove the optimality of belief propagation. So if you look at belief propagation and simulate it and compare it to the uh, rightly chosen oracle estimator, then we observe that in almost all instances, they achieve almost identical performance. The only difficulty is that this oracle estimator, you have to preserve tree structure up to sufficiently large depth, so the, you cannot do it too many, the degree cannot be too large. So that's only computational drawback, but whenever we can do it sufficiently with large graph, it seems to match. So we had this conjecture that BP might be optimal, but building on Neiman Mosel, <coughs> slide paper on community detection, we show that when degree is sufficiently large so that um, well, degree of the tasks is sufficiently large and then degree of the worker is only two so that the whole graphical model is actually a pairwise graphical model, then we can show that uh, BP is asymptotically optimal. So, so this must Right. Right. But you don't have a threshold. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, because if you have threshold, we know that coding, coding is not. Right? right. But here, I guess. Of the so, what we're trying to prove is that they decay very quickly. We assume it's, we, we think it's true for any regime and any R. R is how many uh, tasks are assigned to each worker. But for now, we can only prove it, uh, the actual correlation decay in this setting. So, and then proof technique will be the typical, perhaps more familiar to you, is correlation decay proof, where you look at a particular task I that you want to uh, estimate, and you look at a tree, local tree of depth K around that node. And on one side, you have Oracle estimator, which tells you or initializes the BP at the leaves with the two labels. And the other side, you do BP. But in our setting, BP, one step is essentially doing majority voting. So you do majority voting to initialize this, um, perhaps, nodes, and do the propagation on top of it. And by comparing these two, you can show that their correlation decays uh, fast, and these two are essentially the same asymptotically in the depth k. Hmm. And one last remark I want to make is that, as um, I guess someone asked uh, minutes ago, uh, if you have adaptivity in these tasks, can you do better? Meaning, you can ask uh, one person to assign, uh, answer some of them, 
and maybe second one to answer some of them. And then you can look at them and say, well, the others are pretty good, but these two are, there's a um, contention. So you can assign maybe those two to the next one to get better, um, uh, better accuracy. And we can sh prove a low, although analyzing upper bound on this uh, or coming up with the techniques for adaptively assigning tasks, which we can analyze is difficult, we can still do the lower bound and show that the lower bound doesn't change in terms of the scaling with the sample mimic some complexity um, for this adaptive scheme. So even if you include all the adaptive task assignment schemes, the sample mimic some complexity would have been the same which is somewhat negative, meaning that you cannot gain too much by adaptivity. And the main reason is that the tasks are inherently equally difficult if you look at them. If you didn't, well, given some uh, responses, you might have more, some more that you're sure about than others are not. But in inherently, they're all equally difficult or easy. And that's why there's no gain in uh, uh, adaptive assignment. And perhaps going forward, the more practical, uh, model for crowdsourcing would be having some parameter that captures the difficulty of the tasks. And also, that would mean that for those models, perhaps it makes sense to do adaptivity and try to also identify which ones are difficult and assign more workers to those tasks that are inherently difficult. So the talk, um, the related papers are our um, original NIPS paper and then our recent paper on optimality of belief propagation. And the take home message that I want to again give you is that there are a lot of interesting uh, questions you could ask. For example, what if the uh, tasks are not binary but multi-label? And if the number of labels increases with the size of the graph, do we see perhaps some computational gap as we see in community detection? Could be one interesting uh, question. Another question would be, well, when you're sufficient, when you're below this threshold in community detection, it means that no inference is possible, meaning there's you cannot find the community. But in this case, we believe uh, what might be happening is that no algorithm can do better than majority voting. Because any given any number of nodes or any regime you can do majority voting to get something better than half. Majority voting by the assumption that the expected worker quality is better than half, you do something. But the question is, um, how does it, uh, how much can we do better? And perhaps below certain thresholds, no algorithm can do better than uh, majority voting. So there are other interesting questions that are related to uh, crowdsourcing and I, um, that's what I wanted to um, uh, tell you as a take-home message. Thank you.